So if you want to follow along um, as I'm giving the talk, um, we're here in the schedule in re reproducibility, um, and then in their HTML and PDF slides here, as well as a link um, to a nice uh, list of good scientific coding practices, because um, that's what we're trying to do here is um, good science. All right, so we're talking about reproducibility now. What is re reproducibility? Um, we define it as having a different anal analyst perform the analysis with the same code, the same data, and obtain the same results. So I like to think of it as sort of like a recipe when you're cooking. I love to cook. I love to try out different recipes. And so it's really good to be able to, you know, a, a marker of a good recipe is, did it come out the way you expect it to? And if you go back and um, use the same recipe multiple times, does it taste the same? Do you get the same good mac and cheese that you intended to? So the same thing applies to, um, to code and some scientific practice in general. So we want to be able to take the instructions that we make and be able to apply them to new data and get similar results or, or the same result, especially if, if you're running the same code on the same data. So there are kind of different layers to this that I'll start to unpack. Um, but to walk you through this, we're gonna introduce Ruby the researcher. Um, she, Ruby is doing some really fascinating data on some variables. Um, and she's really excited about a finding that she has. Um, she has a great correlation that she wants to show her colleagues um, and has some working code that is producing this result. I said that we were gonna sort of unpack this. There are different layers of reproducibility. One is repeatability. And that means that Ruby should be able to take the code that she wrote and the data that she's using um, and produce the same result every single time she runs her code again. A second layer of this is reproducibility. So can Ruby take her code and her data and pass it off to her colleague, Avi? And can Avi take her code and produce in, in the same data and produce the same result that Ruby's getting? In an ideal world, you should be able to get the exact same result with these two different researchers. And then the third sort of layer, this you know, hierarchy is, is replicability. And that is Ruby says, I have some really, really cool code that can do this thing. And she passes it to Avi and Avi takes some of his data and implies this his new this code to this this new data, and you know hopefully if if the same data is kind of collected in the same way and should be measuring the same phenomenon, you should hopefully get results that are very similar. So these different layers of reproducibility, you know, ideally, you know, you should be making sure that all the code that you write is repeatable, you know, multiple, every time that you run it, you run it the same way, you get the same data, the same results. The second thing you could do is check that it's reproducible. Give your code to um, a colleague and see if they can get the same result that you're getting on your machine um, using the same data and the same code. And then replicability is, is a much larger um, process that you'll have to collect, go collect some new data and you might have to change some some small things about importing it in. Um, but ideally, the same code, if it functions the same way and the, the data is formatted in the same way, you should get a result. Um, and you can kind of test scientific hypotheses that way and start to see trends across multiple data sets. Any questions there before I move on? I mean, this is, you've probably seen this before. You're all, you know, have taken science classes. I, you know, I use the the analogy of of a recipe. Same thing applies to doing chemistry, right? You want to take really, really good notes in your chemistry notebooks, 
and um, write down your results and show with show your work. That's what we're trying to do here. So reproduces reproducibility is really important because in the process of doing science, um, we may start to see some you know inconsistencies show up. So take this example. Ruby is doing this work, and when she runs her code on her data on her machine, she gets a correlation of 0.893. Great, super you know statistically significant result. But when then Avi runs his code, um, the same code but on his machine, he gets something slightly different, 0.891. It may not be, you know, just drastic enough to um, to change any sort of, you know, conclusions about the data, but this still kind of rubs you the wrong way. That it, sh it should feel weird. Something is something's um, going on under under the hood here that we should probably find out um, what's causing this discrepancy between these two um, these two runs of the same code. Because if this is broken, this very simple thing is, there might be something more drastic that's, that might also be broken. So we are, we're, we're following this sort of pie in the sky idea of reproducibility um, because it has such high payoffs. You know, you can do these large meta-analyses and, and other things and, and find out some really um, important scientific findings. Um, if we have reproducible find like reproducible code um, that can be used across many data sets. So it's um, for the practice in the in the evolution of science of science, we should all be pursuing reproducibility. Um, oh, I'm going backwards now. Sorry. <laughs> all right. The other thing that is that's really nice is. Reproducibility is really um, taking care of your future self. Um, so I might write some code um, as part of one project um, and I forget about it. I go down, I you know have to put it away and go work on another project for a while and I come back to it a year later. Well, ideally I should be able to take the old code that I was using before and it should give me the same result. Um, as long as it was written well, um, or you might be able to take some code that you used in a, a previous analysis um, and be able to use it, use some new data, like take it, bring in that new data and run the same tests. So it is, it's, it makes things, uh, projects run more efficiently when you can kind of reuse code. So this process of sort of going from repeatability all the way up to repro reproducibility will involve maybe getting your code to work once, um, getting your code to work reliably for you, producing the same results, and then getting your code to work for someone else. And we're having you work in our Markdown notebooks because they're really, really a, a great tool for reproducibility. Um, because not only can you show your work, you can also write text that about sort of what are your, what's your interpretation of the plots and the, you know, the summary tables that you're producing. Um, so it can give somebody who's reading the report a better sense of the data that you are working on or some of the open questions. Um, And you could, the nice thing is when you build a, a plot or something like that, and somebody really likes the plot that you made, there's the code right above it. Um, and our markdown lets you sort of like test things as you go. Um, and you can kind of, you can have your text that you're writing, describing your methods, and then you can have a code chunk where you are actually doing what you say you're going to do. Um, and then you can have a plot that can show, you know, beautiful gra graphics um, that you can impress your, your colleagues with. Um, 
and it, you know, it helps with communication because you can also just send this HTML report to somebody and they have all of your code and your, and your output. The nice thing also is um, you can use our markdowns as um, reports that can continuously update. Um, so say you are working on a clinical trial and there's going to be phases of data input. Um, and maybe in the first, you write all this code to sort of do preliminary analyses of the data. And six months from now, you get a you know, a hundred more patients um, enrolled and through the trial, and now you have the data. Well, then you could just, you know, ideally, if you if your your R Markdown notebook is set up well, um, you could just import that updated data and produce a whole new report, all in you know, just one by clicking knit. You know, it's one one keystroke away, um, and you can have a whole new report. So it really is efficient for um, communicating results um, to your colleagues. One thing that's really helpful to ha have is um, kind of good sanitary practices while you are coding, um, especially if you are in the midst of writing a script or working in an R markdown notebook. And you might be writing some things in a script or you're in code chunks, or um, you might be putting things in the environment or just kind of playing around with things in the environment. Um, your environments might start to get cluttered with things that you don't want to have um, that might actually get in the way of your analysis. Um, so it's actually a good practice just to use this little broom icon in our studio to clean up your and our environment periodically um you don't want you don't necessarily want to do it all the time but periodically you just want to clean it out and just rerun everything um just to make sure that the code is running the way you expect it to um and is not missing some of these assignments that you that you may have done in the terminal And you can also kind of regularly check, are things looking good? You know, while you're working in our studio, your graphics may look perfectly fine, but then when you actually go to, to knit it into the final HTML report, the graphics, you know, your the plot that you thought was really nice is shrunk down to some tiny little thumbnail, or just there's a table that's way, way too long. So you can you can tweak things as you go, um, so that you're not sending a, you know, a hundred page HTML to to your boss, <laughs> and they're like, "What is this?" Um, yeah, I mean that's what we're trying to do here: is be good to your future self, so you can can do things efficiently um, and learn from your past mistakes. Um, and also collaborate more effectively with, with other scientists. Um, some other things about our Markdown reports, um, it has a particular syntax for the text that you're writing. Um, so we'll talk a lot about the, the R code chunks that you're gonna make, um, but you can also do some formatting for the text to make things look really nice in our report. So. You can vary the size of um, kind of headers by putting this ha hash mark in front of it. Um, or you can have two for slightly smaller subheaders. Um, you will use asterisks. Um, two of them will make the text bold. And then um, just one on either side will italicize it. And then when you are writing an R code chunk, you needed to have these three back ticks, right? Before, before that and to close out the R code chunk. So if you don't use that really 
um, frequently. It's up in the top left corner of your keyboard. Um, I sometimes forget where it is. So that's where it is. Um, if you are just writing some text and you want to refer to a function or something, some or some object, that's an R object. You can put these back ticks around it and it'll format it um, in a font that looks like code. Um, so that's just a nice thing for, for, for making your reports a little more um, varied um, to help people follow along kind of in that, that interface between text and code and, and all the other things that you might have in a report. If you need reference, um, our studio is really, really has tons of great references. Um, so you can find those within our studio under help cheat sheets. Um, and there's like an R markdown cheat sheet. Um, I think we also have some links to some other cheat sheets uh, within the course um, at, on the, the course page. So take check those out. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. You can create tables of contents and have you know scientific references at the bottom of your reports as well. There's kind of a lot to get into if, if you're really interested. But I kind of wanted to circle back here and talk about you know, this this little conundrum that Avi and Ruby were having, um, where they had they got two different correlations with what they thought was the same code. Well, often the cause of that is using different versions of R. Um, so Ruby was using version 4.1.1, and Avi was using a, an older version. Um, and the trouble is, is he also had a bunch of packages um, that were also out, outdated. Because this, because R is an open source software, um, you know, scientists and coders are updating and fixing bugs and doing things. And they once those are fixed, they put them up on CRAN and they're available for people to download. So you will constantly see as you work in R, that packages get updated. Um, so you want to keep up the pace of doing that, or at least um, do a very good job of documenting which package, which R version you're using, and which packages, which versions of packages you're using as well. Um, so that when you send your code off to somebody else and they're trying to reproduce what you've done, they have those references. And, and those are an additional additional information that's needed to reproduce some some results. So just keep that in mind um, as you kind of go forward with this. A really, really useful function to use um, kind of in pursuit of this, um, kind of documenting what versions you're using. Um, you can enter session info um, in the console. And it will tell you which version of R you're using, which version of R Markdown, and a whole list of all the other installed packages that you have. And it turns out Ruby and Avi were using a whole constellation of different stuff here. So it's kind of no surprise that they got different results. Here's a big list of additional resources. Yeah. I guess um, one thing to maybe point out is, is we had all of you install the newest version of R that you could prior to this class, and hopefully that puts us all on the same page. But in general, it's good to stay up to date, um, you know, just like we would with our operating system, assuming everything is secure. Um, so just something to keep in mind and keep on top of. Um, and uh, I guess, um, I don't know if I'll throw this out there to, to Cliff and to, to Carrie, um, if there's any other practices we think about like installing um, packages or updating uh, newer versions of packages, like what kind of schedule, time schedule we might want to be on for those kind of things. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, so someone pointed out that, you know, it's fairly easy to 
to do these updates or installations, but sometimes it can actually affect your code because an argument name changed and then your code no longer works. So sometimes you have to actually adjust things or your code gave a significant result and it doesn't anymore because the way that a certain model is working, if you're using some particular kind of model, doesn't do the same thing anymore. So that's a problem or like a parameter changed in the way that it was doing something. So you need to know the details of what the update actually does. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the update is better per se. Um, so that's also something to investigate. What, what actually happened with this update? Um, especially when we're using statistical packages to analyze data. If we're using wrangling packages or visualization packages like ggplot2, which we'll talk about later, it's usually going to be fine to update that. You might just have some broken code because you have to change an argument. But generally, that's going to be great to update. But thinking more, you might there's a little more nuance involved in, in stats packages. Yeah, and the schedule, like how often do I do it just in my general upkeep? I actually kind of do it on the schedule whenever our studio, um, whenever I open up our studio and it says a new version is available for our studio, <laughs> I'll update our studio and then I'll also go check and see if there's a new version of R. I tend to be like more of an updater. Um, but yeah, I'm also cognizant, like aware that I don't want to mess up any code that's been available, you know, that might mess up results. But I've only ever happened that had that happen once um, in like 12 years of, of doing R. So I think it's you can you can stay on top of it pretty well. Just don't do it like the night before a big presentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and again, like just, you know, if you're using some statistical package or um, an informatics genomics package or something that like did some sort of, if you're familiar with the field, a gene set enrichment analysis in a particular way, and it had a particular kind of threshold, and that's why you had a significant result before and you don't anymore. Understanding why that happened is really important. Um, so, you know, not, this is not to say that you should pick the version that gives you a significant result, not suggesting that, just want to be very clear, but um, sometimes it makes sense and it is a good reason why you got a significant result. And maybe that is the version of that type of analysis that you actually wanted to run um, and the threshold that you were hoping to use. So um, if you do get a change in your result, which happened to me actually multiple times um, in my career, then you know you might want to look into what happened with your packages. Yeah, and I think it's also like sort of what I was talking about with like coding hygiene. Um, we'll talk about this once we like really start to dive into functions and things like that. But certain functions will have default parameters that are in there, um, and you just need to be, you know, aware of those things. And you know, sometimes when uh, packages get updated, they might change those defaults. And so if you're not, if you weren't explicit about which default you chose, um, then you might get a different result. So it's it's good to get, you know, be as detailed as possible um, in your code. And that's why when we report our findings, it's so useful for us to say what version we did use because someone might try to reproduce your results years later. Um, and you know, you can only do your analysis with what's up to date at the time. And so you you did your best and that's fine. But someone else, um, you know, tries to figure out why did you get this result? And they see, oh, they must have done used this default. Now when I try that default, I get the same result. So it can be a really nice tool for them to figure that out. Exactly. And so that's part of why, you know, I, I had in the chat too, like and Cliff was describing, you know, cleaning your environment. Um, when we run our code in the R markdown, it's like running our code as if we have a completely clean environment. And so scripts can be useful for other more advanced like programmatic things that would involve more advanced computer science that you might need that to do um, like iterative work or something like that. But typically for 
public health research, it's going to be helpful to have that report or a record of what you did. And um, being able to run that in that test of that clean environment is super useful.